Well, if you have your Bibles, please go ahead and stand and turn with me to Luke chapter 2 and follow along as I read for us from verses 22 through verse uh, 38. So Luke chapter 2, go ahead and follow along as I read for us verses 22 through verse 38. If you're using the Bible that's in the seat in front of you, it's on page 500. Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 22 all the way to verse 38. Hear now the word of the Lord. And when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they, Joseph and Mary, brought him, Jesus, up to Bethlehem to present him to the Lord. As it was written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous, and he was devout, awaiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him, and had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the customs of the law, he took him up in his arms, and he blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed. A sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher, and she was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who are waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. This is God's word, and all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Well, this is by far one of my favorite times of the year, and I don't think I'm the only one in feeling all the warm and fuzzy feelings uh, uh, you know, around Christmas time. Uh, there's certainly something special and fun about the hustle and and the bustle of getting prepared for Christmas Day uh, when everyone is together and and for the most part hopefully also getting along and children aren't fighting over who got a better gift and that sort of thing. Uh, But for many people, uh, that is the best that it gets. Some good food, some presents, some maybe seeing some loved ones, seeing loved ones for the holidays. But, but for us as followers of Jesus, for us as believers, we celebrate because we know that this is not actually the best that it gets. We celebrate because we are actually awaiting a fullness of what is yet to come. That these are just, again, these, these moments, these are a snapshot of the glorious reality of which we are awaiting. That as we celebrate the first advent, we are also, with great anticipation, awaiting the second coming where everything is fulfilled, where there's fullness, where there is peace on earth. Now, our celebration is, like I said, mixed with anticipation. Uh, We are celebrating and we're waiting when we at last will be able to see him clearly and not darkly as through a uh, a mirror, as as Paul says in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13, verse 12. So then we, we live in between these advents. There's joy for us to hold on to in the in-between, which anchors our souls as we feel the longing for an end to all of the struggles and difficulties of life. There's, there's this period of in-between, and, and that is the period in which we live in. And, and there's some, some similarities between the, the first advent of Jesus and the second advent all is not well in our world, and a little chart if that's helpful for you, but not all is well in our world. Uh, there's longing for justice. There's a desire for things to be made right. 
the wicked are thriving. It seems that the righteous are perishing. Kingdoms and nations are at war with each other. People are oppressed, and actually more people are enslaved today than ever before in human history. There's an estimated 50 million people, according to multiple credible, so credible sources, 50 million people that are in slavery today, generating about $150 billion. That's billion with a B. So not all is well. The world is not at peace. But there's also some differences between the first coming of Jesus and the second coming. And as you see here, in the first advent, Christ came as a baby, but the second, he's coming as a king. He came in humility, but he's coming again with full glory and triumph. He came to rescue and save at the first advent, but he's coming to rule and to judge in the second. He returned to heaven to come again, and when he comes back, he'll come for all of eternity. And all of these are meant to draw our attention and to give us a sense of joy. And as we saw last week, the, the buildup surrounding the first coming of Jesus is meant to, to teach us how to prepare ourselves to usher in this second advent. And so our passage this morning before us in Luke chapter 2 walks us through how to live a life that is joyous in our celebration of Christ's coming. So the first thing we see here in our passage is this, that joy is found in dependence. Joy is found in our dependence. And if, we were, if I were to ask you, if we were to come up with a, a definition for what joy is, what would we say? How would you define joy? And kind of building on the past two weeks, a helpful, helpful definition that, uh, that I found this week uh, for me was this. It's an unrelenting hope and peace despite circumstances. Or this, having this unrelenting hope and peace in the face of differing circumstances. So joy is not just merely an emotion, although there's certainly some emotional components to it, because you can have joy in the midst of sorrow. It's possible to have joy in hardships. So joy has to be something more than just an emotion. It has to be based on something much more substantial than just a feeling. That is why joy is better than happiness, because happiness is rooted in circumstance, while joy exists outside of or in spite of circumstances. So let's take that a step further and, and clarify that our joy is not found on circumstances, but neither is it founded on optimism and, sent and sentimentalism. It's not built on sentiments. Our, our joy is built on, on something a lot more concrete, something a lot more sure. It's built upon the, the person of Jesus who is our living hope and our prince of peace and Therefore, he is our steadfast joy, regardless of our circumstances. And, and this is such an assurance for us because our joy, again, is not circumstantial. It's not shallow. Our joy is constant because it's found in the one who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So with all of this as an introduction, understanding what joy is, Let's look at our text in front of us, because we've just read of Mary and Joseph and, and Jesus making their way to Jerusalem from Bethlehem. And now we're introduced to two other individuals who had been awaiting and believed in the coming of the Messiah. But before we look at Simeon and Anna, I, I want us to pause and just reflect on both Mary and Joseph. Because in their situation, in their journey, we see this example of what joy looks like in spite of circumstances. Luke makes the, the poverty of this young couple clear in the text. If we look here in uh, verse 22 through 24, it says, especially in verse 24, to offer a sacrifice according to what was said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So they were presenting an offering as a public declaration of having little means, yet it showed their faith in God to provide and to sustain. See, the, 
The price for two turtle doves or for two doves was merely pennies. That's all they could afford. They couldn't afford a lamb. They couldn't afford a bull. They couldn't afford a goat. They couldn't afford a, a, a better sacrifice. All they could afford was two turtle doves. Just two pigeons. Probably cost a couple pennies. And as one commentator puts it, Joseph and Mary personified the paradox of being profoundly empty and yet profoundly full. Blessed are those, Jesus says, who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. And as they approach the house of God with, with almost nothing, they receive what few others in history ever received. See, there's this richness in their poverty because it's not measured by financial stability. There's a there's substance to their faith because it's not measured by emotions or by optimism or by circumstance, but by confidence. And they serve as a powerful reminder to us that the gospel is always about our dependence on God and never about what we bring to the table. There's this undeniable and, and really this unbreakable bond between joy and dependence, that, that we see joy the most expressed we see joy manifest itself in our dependence uh, our spiritual destitution requires this this complete dependence on god to provide and the greater my dependence on god the fuller my joy becomes uh, the greater your dependence on god the fuller your joy becomes in life and again it, it's this this glorious irony of the gospel that joy is most keenly felt when we're at our most helpless state and acknowledge our need. And I don't want you to confuse this with some type of suffering gospel as if joy is found in difficulty, as if we need to suffer in order to find joy. But, but instead, to understand that our joy comes in a coming to the one who meets us in our needs, joy is found in the one who satisfies our deepest needs. And it's fascinating that joy eludes those who think that they're self-sufficient and who have no need for dependence on God. And, and again, it's fascinating that, that Jesus calls all to himself, but in order for someone to come to Jesus, they have to acknowledge their need for him because Jesus does not come to the self-sufficient, but to those who express their need for him. Jesus, and therefore joy, comes to those of us who humbly acknowledge our need for him and his rightful rule over our lives. So joy, real and lasting joy, is found in placing ourselves in the hand of our living hope and in our prince of peace. So that's Mary and Joseph. Let's turn our attention now to Simeon and Anna. And all that we know about these two individuals is what was written here in our passage. Simeon, he was aged in years and he lived in Jerusalem. He was devout and he was righteous and he was waiting for the Messiah, for the consolation of Israel. Historically, a few scholars have suggested that this Simeon is actually the son of the great rabbi uh, Hillel, the father of Gamaliel, who was, uh, if you remember in Acts, he was the man that, that um, discipled and taught the apostle Paul. Paul sat at the feet of Gamaliel. And, and regardless of whether or not this is true, the point is not who he was, but instead the kind of man he was. And Luke is certain to give us plenty of uh, explanation and, and tell us who he was. And then we have Anna. And what we know about Anna is that she is, she's very old. Whether she actually is 84 years old or if she was a widow for 84 years, we're not quite sure. But what we know is that she was aged. She, was, she, was, uh, she, she had been a widow for many years. She was a prophetess who had spent every day in the temple worshiping God and waiting for the Messiah. She comes from the tribe of Asher and was the daughter of Phanuel. So all these details matter because Luke is making sure that everyone knows that this happened at a specific time to specific people at a specific place. This is real. This is historical fact that the Messiah was born in Bethlehem, went to Jerusalem after eight days, was presented at the table. These are people that you can, that, that you're able to trace in human history. This actually happened. This is no fairy tale. This is not the story of the magic of Christmas. This is reality. This is what happened. 
So both Simeon and Anna are described as being both devout and righteous, careful in their duties and service to God, and careful in how they live their lives around other people. So both Simeon and Anna were cautious to obey and honor God and took care to live lives that were worth emulating. Now, their story is written for us to replicate. Uh, Their story is one that is seeped in joy, but that joy manifests itself in tangible ways. Uh, That they served God by by being obedient to him, in joyful obedience. That's something we like to, you know, instruct our children. Hey, it's it's one thing to obey, but you you need to also obey joyfully, right? With a good attitude. Uh, that, that we are to live lives worth imitating by those who are watching us. I don't know if you've, if you've come across people or you rub shoulders with other believers and, and you see this, this joy that emanates out of them, that, that just being around them, you see the joy of the Lord. And, and, and it gives them strength, but it gives you strength just to be around them. And, and this is, this is what, what these two individuals lived like. This is what, what they were to be around. And they were waiting for a person, not just an event. And while they were waiting, they were working. Now, next Sunday, my family and I will be driving to the suburbs of Chicago to celebrate Christmas with our extended family. Um, Just keeping up with the texts and the emails from the family is a part-time job. So many details. But but the excitement is palpable, right? There's so much hard work to be done. There, there's so much preparation in the waiting. There's so many things that, that as we anticipate, we work. And, and we, we celebrate while we wait as believers. And yet as we wait, we look at how Simeon and Anna waited because they waited with purpose and with hard soul work. Because we are called to joy in difficulty, knowing that our difficulties has a purpose. And that our joy is not necessarily coming out of those difficulties, but that he is with us in the midst of those difficulties. That our joy is not circumstantial, but it's a person. We, we rest while we work, and we work while we rest, meaning understanding that we rest in the completed work of Christ while we do this, this soul work, examining ourselves daily to see if we're really walking in the faith. We prioritize what the world would deem silly, and we, we, would, we would deem silly what the world prioritizes. We would live with this urgency because the days are short and the time is near. And, and we would pray that thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So there's this, this, this joyous expectation, knowing that today matters. There's purpose in today. And yet there's also the expectation and the joy and the hope and the peace that all will be made right. That at his second coming, everything will be made right. May God help us to clear anything in our hearts, in our lives, that will stop us from from truly saying, as we sang before, come thou long expected Jesus. But secondly, Jesus brings joy and comfort in our waiting. Here is this man and this woman waiting and waiting and waiting. Years of waiting. And in the midst of those, of those years, there's all this, this turmoil, political, social, economic turmoil. And yet, Jesus brings joy and comfort in our waiting because once he appears, all would be worth it. And and every Jewish man and woman and child knew the promises of the Old Testament. Everyone knew the the, the prophecies of the Old Testament, specifically in Isaiah, where where God calls himself a comforter and he promises to send a comforter. Isaiah 40, Isaiah 49, Isaiah 61. Shout for joy, you heavens. Rejoice, you earth. Burst into song, you mountains. For the Lord comforts his people and will have compassion on his afflicted ones. Isaiah 61, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. Why? Because the Lord has appointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. You're brokenhearted? The Lord has sent Christ to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives. Are you captive? 
what sin wraps its, its chains around your heart and your life. Jesus has come to set free the captives, to release from darkness for the prisoners. Are you living in darkness? Light has come. Isaiah 66, verse 13, As a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you, and you will be comforted. In all these passages, yes, they refer to the Old Testament and to, to the Jewish people, but they're promises for the future, not just for Israel, but also for us as Gentiles. And this is what Simeon is saying. This is why he's so excited in verses 25 and onward. That, that salvation, that peace, that joy has come not just to Israel, but to all nations. The Messiah is not just a comforter for some, but he is a comforter for all who would believe. And, and that today we have the luxury of looking at the entirety of Scripture and seeing that theme, but you have to put yourself in Simeon's shoes. You have to imagine for the first time holding this baby and realizing that all the comfort promises of Isaiah, everything that everyone's been waiting for is happening. Finally. And, and that the assurance is not in a baby, but is the assurance is in the person of God. That this baby would become the Savior of the world. Again, not circumstance, but a person. And Simeon, again, takes this baby in his arms, and, and he, he breaks into this prophetic poetry. God, you can now, you can bring me home. My eyes have seen your salvation that you've prepared. And in that moment, he says, Lord, I'm at peace. I've seen your joy. I can go home now. I don't, I don't think anyone would have a better bucket list than be able to, to hold Jesus in their arms, right? Joy has come. Comfort has come. The Messiah has come for you and for me. And lastly, Jesus reveals the allegiance of our hearts. In verses 34 through 35, after Simeon finishes this, this song of praise, he turns to Mary, and then he addresses her with this sobering declaration. He says that, that a sword will pierce your heart also, and that this child will be able to reveal the hearts of men and women. That Jesus is the ultimate determiner, uh, uh, is the ultimate person to determine people's destiny because he is the ultimate revealer of their hearts and their ultimate allegiance. So Jesus is the comforter who will be very uncomfortable for many people. Jesus is the light that will be rejected for darkness by many. Jesus is the hope that will be ridiculed by many who live in deep despair. Jesus is the salvation that will cause the condemnation of many. And so Jesus is, this very, is the most polarizing figure in history because Jesus is the only one who reveals the true condition of someone's heart. And Jesus lays us bare, and reality, once he lays us bare, the response is either repentance or rejection. Jesus is the most polarizing figure in human history because once we come face to face with Jesus, either we repent and we believe or we reject and we harden our hearts. And mankind's truest inner thoughts are revealed for what they really are. And this is why John would say that in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. And then in Hebrews, and the Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. And as such, mankind will always either oppose Jesus apart from the grace of God or by the grace of God will believe. No matter how much goodwill humanity it tries to stir up towards one another, much as we want to sing these uh, songs of Christmas cheer and Christmas magic and miracles, the reality is that all of that laid before Jesus is exposed for what it is. Absolutely powerless. Sentiment that lacks the ability to, tra to transform. But, but here is the, here's the good news of Christmas. Here's the good news of joy that has come for all people. That Christ has been born in Bethlehem and that his birth has, has come to, to show us where we are at. That it is God's grace to us to reveal our hearts so that he could change our hearts. It is the kiss of death. It is the judgment of God if he would have left us as we were. It would have been 
judgment had God not exposed our need for him and offer a remedy. The joy of Christmas is the fact that Jesus reveals our inner thoughts. Jesus reveals the, st the status of our hearts. And he not only reveals it, but he does something about it. Thanks be to God for the fact that he has shown us who we really are and our need for him. But thanks be to God who through Christ Jesus has awakened us to this knowledge of sin and has given us this grace to desire forgiveness and has given us this, this power to confess. And so this morning as I close, we celebrate the incarnation at its first coming. L let us remember that this was good. That, that, that the fact that Jesus came and that he lays your heart bare, this is good news. Don't hide from that. Don't shy away. Come and let your heart be exposed so that it can be changed, so that it can be transformed. Because the coming of Jesus reveals the allegiance of our hearts. And what we know is that every heart and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. It's not a matter of if, but it's a matter of when. And as we sang about 20 minutes ago, born to reign in us forever, now thy gracious kingdom bring by thine own eternal spirit, rule in our hearts alone. By thine all-sufficient merit, raise us to thy glorious throne. Jesus says, behold, I'm coming soon. And I will bring my reward with me. And I will repay each one for what he's done. The spirit and the bride says, come. And let the one who hears us say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires to take the water of life without price, let him come. That is the beauty of Christmas. That is the invitation of Christmas. Joy, unspeakable joy, not because you bring something to the table, but because Jesus has not only paid it all, but gives it all for us. Will you join me in prayer? God, we thank you so much that our confidence is not on performance, our assurance is not on merit. That our joy is not based on what we bring to you, but it's founded upon the strong promises upon you that you have accomplished everything for us. And you call all who hear this to believe, to repent, and to accept new life. We ask, Lord, that if there's any here this morning who are still living in darkness, that the light of Christ would shine in their hearts. If there's any who are under the bondage of sin, that you would loosen them from those sins, that you would bring them from the, from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. God, we pray for those who are walking in sadness and in um, despair, that you would give them the joy and the peace and the comfort that only comes from you. We thank you, God, that you are stronger and you're greater than our, than our circumstances and that our assurance is found in you. We thank you we get to celebrate, we get to remind ourselves of what is true. We ask these things in your name. Amen.